this book, Land. Thank you for joining us. So we'll start with our evening meditation. God is the love that I am. So just take a breath and center yourself. And you can just focus on God is the love that I am with the chant, or you can just focus on your breath, or you can just focus on God is, I am. The point is, let's focus inward.
Ah, God is the love that I am. Can you feel that joy just fill your entire spirit? Holy cow. Okay, welcome. So glad you're here with us. Welcome again if you joined us during meditation on Zoom or Facebook Live. Let's start it off with our chant. God. God is in. Yes, God is in this place right here, right now. So let's take a moment and let's pray. What a blessing it is to stop in this moment and recognize the power, the presence, the good of God flowing always, infinitely, eternally, in through and as each and every one of us. So tonight's service is blessed. Something magnificent is happening. I claim right here, right now, I know right here, right now, that Reverend Sidney is open, available, and God moves through her with a word that strikes the hearts, the souls, the minds of each and every one of us, and what needs to be healed is healed, what needs to be transformed is transformed, and what needs to be lifted is lifted for our gathering here tonight. We bless our musicians, we bless Sam, we bless all our technicians, all the people who come forward and say, yes, I will serve. Yes, thank you. We bless you. We're grateful for you. All is well. Something magnificent is happening tonight because we are here. So I release this word into the law of mind where it is made manifest. And so it is. And in agreement, we say, Amen. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good evening, everybody. This is a original song called Living the Dream. Turn the key, open the door 
When nothing's left, find some more. I feel the change, I hear it turn around. I see that change, I feel it coming now. I told you a few weeks ago when I first started that if the spirit moved me to dance, I was going to do it. And tonight I was doing some chair dancing. <laughs> you are fierce. We are all fierce. Say that with me. I am fierce. I, I am a fierce, loving being of God. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So I just have to digress. I know I haven't even started. How can I digress? Maybe it's just aggress. <laughs> when I first started in New Thought, I was probably eight or nine years old, and the music back then was, um, it sucked. <laughs> what we would have, and those of you who've been around for a long time might remember, we'd have congregational songs like, it's up to you, new thought, new thought. I mean, it was just, it was brutal. So hearing this is just so, it's such a, it's such a blessing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my goodness. All right. That's enough gressing. Years ago, I was in Europe and I was really fortunate to be there. I was touring as part of a band that was accompanying um, a concert artist. And, and what I loved is that we had some time off. We had actually quite a bit of time off. And so when I had those days, I would find museums. I would explore. I wanted to know more about the culture because I'd never been to Europe. And I just was so excited about it. So I will never forget that one day I had a day, I, I, was, I had the day off in Frankfurt, Germany. And this was so exciting to me. I stood before, I went to museums and I stood before paintings by Rembrandt. And my heart just went, oh. And, and I, I had this sense of reverence for this talent, for this extraordinary talent, this gift. It was, it, I, I felt like I had this incredible privilege of being in the room to actually stand before an original Rembrandt. So that same day, I went to the house where Goethe was born. Right, Goethe, the philosopher? Holy cow, he was born in 1749. I was breathless. I imagined him in that house. I remember the very rough-hewn 
stair rails as the, the stairway that, go, that went upstairs and the, the stairs were so old. I mean, you know, 1749, they had kind of a bow to them and they were just so incredibly beautiful. I was so moved because Goethe was a contemporary of Beethoven's and I love Beethoven. I'm, I am really, really just so moved by Beethoven's music. So full disclosure though, I have to tell you that same day um, I went to the Barbie Museum, and I have these, these memories of these various displays of Barbie dressed up as a prom queen, a housewife, and believe it or not, a dominatrix. Okay, now I played with Barbies a lot when I was a kid, but seriously, I do not remember Mattel ever offering the dominatrix Barbie, so make of that what you will. But thinking back to my sense of the sacred and the miraculous of sharing space with Rembrandt, Goethe, Beethoven, and, you know, dominatrix Barbie, I, it makes me wonder, and I thought about this today, how often do you and I recognize our own precious, miraculous beauty? Do we take the time to consciously value our own lives, our own divinity, the way we value a great piece of art? or music? Do we cherish ourselves enough? So I'm not talking about narcissism or egocentric being. I'm talking about the value we hold when it comes to believing we are enough. So let's just cut right to the chase. Do you think you are enough? Do you believe that you are enough? You know, I've been I've been working with one of my favorite books by an author, Wayne Mueller, and it's titled A Life of Being, Having, and Doing Enough. It's a great book. So the crux of it is that when we don't believe that we are already enough, and that's my talk title, You Are Already Enough, we tend to make decisions, choose partners, and in general, just live our lives from the need to fill up our existence, our experience with those things, those, those people, those experiences that are going to somehow make us believe or feel, if only temporarily, that we're enough. So when we choose from a need to feel better about ourselves, to feel okay or acceptable, those results produce a whole different array of, of the results from choosing from a desire to create, to express, because you already know that you are enough, that you are val valued, valid, and worthy. So the problem, of course, is that when we need to and seek fulfillment from out here, uh, we might feel okay for a while, because we have lots of stuff, or maybe even self-worth by association. Anybody ever hooked up with someone because they were really, really attractive or famous and you thought, well, that makes me look really, really darn good. Yeah, my husband's raising his hand. Isn't he amazing? <laughs> I love this man. We are, we, tomorrow we are celebrating 23, 23? 24 years of marriage. Thank you. <laughs> 24. He does math, I do spelling, okay. But getting stuff or having friends with a lot of stuff only means we start drowning in stuff. At best, stuff requires maintenance, you know, it requires keeping track of it and dusting it, cleaning it. In truth, however, stuff can easily and addictively become a distraction from healing. Attending to a lot of stuff often turns into not attending to our souls, our hearts, our life's purpose. So we live in a culture, and especially we live in a town, we're in LA, let's just you know, call it what it is, that honors and even seems sometimes to really worship materialistic pursuits and accomplishments. And it's really easy to find yourself caught up in that whole thing. It's very easy, it's a mindset that says that we need to acquire now so that you can perhaps enjoy what you really care about later. Right, get it all now and you can, you can ease into life and do what you want, travel or create, paint, sing, you can do that later, but right now you gotta get, you gotta get. So in his book, Wayne Muller writes this, the distractions and worries of the world are doggedly persistent and before long we may find ourselves trading away our days and our dreams. And he also said this, when we are increasingly drained 
pressed for time and afraid we may never taste the simple gifts of blessings or nourishment, we are inclined to grasp for some substitute. We are more easily seduced by certain behaviors or possessions that promise to give us not precisely what we dreamed, but something that looks close enough. Close enough. In other words, we can do the deep work, the deep soul work of learning to love ourselves as perfect and worthy creations of spirit, or we can choose that fast track to temporary distraction and preoccupi preoccupation with our stuff, right? With those people who make us temporarily believe like we are worth something, that we matter. Distraction is absolutely a possibility, but it is not a very sustainable protocol. So I think what it really is is that we try to stuff down our existential panic of not living our truth or our authenticity. And we, we work towards the stuff. We work hard and we, we race towards it and we, we compete with other people and we say, look at my stuff, look at my stuff, look at this person, look at all the stuff that I've become and that I can do. And yet within there's this panic because we're not actually living from our hearts. We're not actually living authentically. We're not living that, that dream. We're not living that dream that has been planted within us that only you can realize, that only I can realize. And when we don't do that, often we find ways to distract ourselves from it. But the paradox is that when we really get, really get that we are divine in creation and infinite in potential, that's what Eric Butterworth used to say, we no longer need the stuff, we don't need the acclaim, and we don't have to stuff down that anxiety about not being enough. But until we know we are enough, we will not be enough. Until we really know that we are enough, we will not be enough. It's, it's a paradox, truly, because what we have to do is move into the consciousness of knowing who we are, whose we are, as divine, perfect beings necessary to that fulfillment of God's creativity. We are God's creativity. We are God's process. We are God's creative process showing up in the world wearing a brown sweater today. That's what we are. That's who we are. That's who and what we are. So when we begin to know that we are enough, that's when we begin to demonstrate an abundant life. But at that point, what's so interesting about it is we no longer have this addiction to our stuff. It's no longer needed. We can take it or we can leave it. I love retail therapy as much as anybody. <laughs> and, and both Doreen and Terry could tell you that um, I've been celebrating the American system um, of materialism and retail therapy lately because anything I order I've been getting delivered here so and let me just give you a little backstory some context we've been in an Airbnb since August 19th and it's about 400 square feet and we have a whole bunch of stuff in a pod in storage and then we have the rest of our stuff in Oregon in storage waiting for when we finally close escrow on this house that we bought so we can have all of our you know stuff so um, I find myself going oh my gosh I don't have a bunch of stuff that I need. You know, like, like I only brought a certain number of shirts and pants and, and so, you know, we, we do what we do. We run to Macy's or we send to Macy's. I, I, um, I order out, yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> we celebrate that, but, but we are not beings who are here to live according to our stuff. There's more to you and to me than what we buy, who we are hanging out with, what we think we have to do, and what we have to attract, and what we have to, oh, God, show other people. You know, so it's, it's that thing of are we living for the world out here or are we living for this world in here? When we no longer try to distract from our fears about the lives we're living with getting, we find that we have moved into letting. And I remember hearing a talk that Michael Beckwith did a couple months ago. And he said, are you praying to get? 
or are you praying to let? And so we don't need to get that enoughness. We have to let that enoughness inform us. We have to be willing to come into the consciousness of knowing we are all ready that. Show me God. Show me spirit. Show me life. Show me infinite spirit. Whatever it is that you, that your talisman is for connecting with a deeper awareness. That you prove me now that I might pour out the, the blessings, you know, just pour them out. Yes, God, pour out this sense of enough. Pour it from the inside because that's where it is. That's where you and I find our sense of being, our sense of worthiness. Wayne Muller wrote, if we find that we love less and less of what we do, what we choose or what we agree to, and feel more and more like we are barely able to handle our days, it is likely we will experience relatively few genuine feelings of enough in our daily life. He also wrote, on the other hand, the more we choose based on what we love and less on what we can handle, think about that, we are likely to have many sources of sufficiency and nourishment. You know, it's one of these things of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can. I mean, do you really love something and really want it? I teach my students all the time, and I talk about this in my talks and in counseling, that I believe in having a whole body yes. I have a whole body yes to something. And if I don't have that, and it's taken time to really trust that, by the way. If I don't have that whole body, that full body yes, whatever it is, I don't do it. You, you heard her. <laughs> She's right. I read this from, Arthur, from, from the author Parker Palmer today. Is the life I'm living the life that wants to live in me? Is the life I'm living the life that wants to live in me? Or is it the life that is convenient or I settled for or is the one that I can do, even though it's not the one I actually want to be doing, right? Is this, did I choose it? Did it choose me? It's very important to know that. Now, don't in any way hear this as me telling you that you have to leave your jobs to be spiritual or your families, live without things, get, go live it on a mountaintop somewhere without creature comforts or sushi. I am not saying that. Possessions aren't bad. In fact, the world is important. I mean, we, our possessions are important. They keep us comfortable. They keep us warm. People are important. They keep us... Oh my gosh, engage so we can love, so we can serve, so we can be more and share our lives with each other. That's important. But I want you to hear this, and we, last week we talked a lot about prosperity, and this is Charles Fillmore's definition of prosperity. And for those of you who don't know, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore co-founded Unity, oh my gosh, the, about 1897, I think it was. It was way back there, and then they started buildings in the early 20s, the early 1920s, and moved on from there to create a whole, a whole spiritual path. The consciousness of God as the abundant, everywhere present resource, unfailing, ready for all who open themselves to it through faith. That's prosperity. Let me read it again. Take this in. Prosperity is the consciousness of God as the abundant, everywhere present resource, unfailing, ready for all who open themselves to it through faith. So what I want you to hear is that until we address our deepest need, the need to know that we are worthy and we are loved and enough now, no amount of stuff will provide you or me with a connection to God that we actually already have. We already have it. So about 150 years ago, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote this, every man is a doorway through which the infinite passes into the finite, through which God becomes man or woman, through which the universal becomes individual. So think about that. Think about that. We are the doorway through which God passes into this life, shows up as this life, shows up as Sydney in a brown sweater or whoever you are with whatever you're wearing. This is the doorway. You are the doorway. How much of that doorway 
are we willing to have open and to see the light that's in there that wants to come out? Is this the life I'm living? Is this life I'm living the life that wants to live in me? Is this life I'm living the life that wants to live in me? So Ernest Holmes is a guy who founded this church. Some of you might have heard of him. And he wrote a book, he wrote a lot of books, and one of them was titled, This Thing Called You. And, and I just love what he said. He said, you are to believe with utmost simplicity and with complete faith that there is a pattern of your being or a real spirit of you, which is as eternal as God, as indestructible as reality, and as changeless as truth. That's capital T, truth. This pattern is seeking to manifest through you. Back of it all is the will and purpose of the universe, all the irresistible laws of being. Finally, it will win. So we can argue with it, we can deny it, or we can begin to open ourselves to a greater idea every single day. And it doesn't matter if you've been on this path for 20 years or 20 minutes. Every day there's more of God that we can begin to express and show up as because God is infinite. And guess what? That means you and I are also infinite. It could be no other way. The sense of being enough is not something we can buy or snag from out in the world. And it's because you and I are already sourced, already sourced by infinite love the infinite love of God. And what could we possibly buy from Macy's that's better than that? <laughs> but until we begin coming into the consciousness that we already are the beloved of God, and yes, this comes into that place of act as if. Sometimes it's an act as if, but it's also about using your imagination. It's about using your imagination. And we talked last week how Neville Goddard used to write and he used to teach that our imagination is our closest, most imminent, immediate connection to God. It is our imagination. That imagination, that power that you have to imagine, to create something within your mind, that is the Christ part of your being. That is that anointed Christ sacred part of your being. That is the most sacred part of you. That is the God within you. And it is creating and it is giving you ideas all the time. Just as Dr. Mark said the other day, God gives to us by means of ideas. You know, I want to tell you that it, that it really is just like watching Monty Python where the foot comes down from heaven and, you know, and there's your gift. It's not like that. We are given to, from God through the ideas and the inspirations, but we have to take the time to be open to them. And until we do that and really work at convincing ourselves and aligning with it and putting ourselves in that consciousness and being with people who believe that, studying that, spiritual practice of that, we're going to keep running to Macy's. Now, there's nothing against Macy's, but go to the inner storehouse first. Go to that inner reserve force. You know, I believe it is up for all of us right now to slow down, to cease that search for sensory rewards, and listen to that great presence within each of us. And by the way, it doesn't care whether you call it God or source or, or Christ light or infinite being or light or universal presence or Fred, it doesn't care, just as long as that we call on it and, and demand that we see that blessing, that we have that experience, that we know, that we know, that we know. We can certainly come back to the sensory rewards, but it's in the taking time each day to commune with that something greater that's going to start to inform us of a greater truth. So Ernest Holmes also taught this, there is one life, that life is God, that life is your life and my life now. That's what he taught. It's just one life. It's not two lives. It's the one life, the one infinite life, the one infinite intelligence, the one infinite mind. And I think part of it is that we get into a sense of, of dualistic or binary thinking. It can't be God, all God. It must be God and something else, right? It must be God and something else. And I think that this binary thinking informs so much of what we do. And we start looking at the world in terms of, of limitation, as if God isn't all there is. 
there must be limits here. There must be limits, right? There have to be limits. That can't just be God and nothing else. It's all God. It's all God. And that's what we have to practice knowing. We have to practice knowing that. You know, there's this thing, those of you who came to the Brene Brown workshop we did a few weeks ago, she talks about um, comparison suffering. And that idea is that it's wrong for me to feel bad or guilty or sad or concerned about my car having a flat tire or not having enough money because there are children in Africa who are starving. It's the idea that I shouldn't be concerned about expressing my dream or my gift because there are people over here who can't do that. No, that is participating in the idea that there's God in something else. That if, that if you prosper, I won't. That if I prosper, you won't. That if I win, you lose. And that is this pernicious idea of dualistic thinking, of binary thinking, that it has to be one way or the other, that there can't be room on this planet for both a Beethoven and a dominatrix Barbie and everything in between. Because we are living in this infinite field of potentiality, infinite potentiality, and all of it is an expression. All of it is expression. We choose how we want to express it. And there are no limits to what we can do. There are no limits until we tell ourselves that that there are limits, you know, and it's about that telling ourselves that's interesting. There's a Sufi tradition of, about, about speaking. And, no, and the idea is if you're really practicing this idea that you do not say a word to someone, you do not open your mouth until you have sent the words that you're going to speak through three different gates. And the first gate is, is it true? The next one, is it necessary? And the third one, is it kind? And unless that thing which you are being moved to express can walk through all of those gates, and the answer is yes, then you don't say it. It's a pretty simple tradition, isn't it? It's a pretty simple idea. So consider for a moment the words that you might use about yourself to yourself. You know, sometimes we're great about this with other people or to our pets, but how often do we use that same standard for our own self-talk? You know, I, I, it's as if people, in fact, I hear people all the time being concerned that they're going to be, people are going to think that they're too cocky. They're, they're bragging. You know, as if telling spiritual truth about who you, you are, about yourself, could somehow be a problem, like that's a bad thing, give me a break. Come on, we have to stand up and say, I am. I am a being of God. I am hot stuff. I am this creation of spirit. I come from that which is whole, perfect, and complete. I am awesome. I am the awesomeness of God made manifest. I am a demonstration of God. I'm God's demonstration. How cool is that? Those are not the words Those aren't words that people use when they're trying to be humble. But we want you to be strong. You can, humble will come. We're not worried about that. We want the words that say, I am, I am. In fact, I, I started thinking as we were doing the meditation song, that God's the love that I am. I started hearing in my mind, God's the enough that I am. God's the enough that I am. And that's what I was chanting as the music was playing. God's the enough that I am, that I am. So I think God is just waiting for us to get up on our inner soapboxes and speak words of spiritual truth about ourselves. And they absolutely do have to pass through those three gates. Are, is it true, necessary, kind? Am I speaking words to myself that are true? Am I speaking words to and about myself that are necessary? And are they kind? Are they kind? You know, the third one is the kicker, I think. Most of us grew up being taught that we shouldn't speak that well of ourselves. You know, don't blow your own horn. And I gotta say, if, if your words about yourself are true, necessary, and kind, why wouldn't you blow your own horn? I mean, in fact, please do. We need more people blowing their own horns. We really do. This world needs that. I know we've all heard the words that Marianne Williamson wrote that Nelson Mandela quoted. 
our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plain small doesn't serve the world. So any one of us plain small doesn't heal the world. Any one of us not having the prosperity of a free, open, beautiful, fabulous life does not heal this person over here who doesn't have a free, open, fabulous life. In fact, I want to learn by example. I want to see someone who is living a fulfilled life. I want to be around that person. I want to be around someone who is so full of themselves, so full of God, that I know it's okay for me to be full of myself and to be full of God. Don't you? Don't you want to feel that way? I mean, when someone is so certain of who they are and so comfortable in their own being, it feels so good to be around them. It feels so good to be around them. The fundamental flaw that we have, as I said, is that we are in a world that doesn't have enough. And if God isn't enough, how can we possibly be enough? And you know, what we teach is that God is infinite and we are part of that same infinity. So I just want to suggest, if there's even a little bit of not enough thoughts or beliefs dancing around in your head, make today the day that you deny it permission to live there. Make today the day you deny occupancy to anything that is less than the whole truth about you as a perfect, awesome, and enough expression of the divine. You know, sometimes we do let other people's beliefs, their ideas, and their limiting words trample through the gardens of our mind, and all they do is poop on our roses. <laughs> Stop it. Don't let them poop on your roses. Don't even let them in. Stand guard at the gate of your garden and ask the question. Ask the question of every word and with every thought that we let in. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And is it enough? Is it enough? This world in which we live is absolutely big enough, magnificent enough, and infinite enough to celebrate both the magic of Beethoven and the curiosity around dominatrix Barbie. So be that. Be that enough. Begin to affirm and come into that consciousness now that you are enough. In fact, you are well beyond enough. You are infinite. You are hot stuff. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. So I invite everyone to just simply take a breath and release. And one more. Take a breath and just relax into that chair knowing that you are supported by that chair as a metaphor for the way that you are supported by this universe, by God. And as you release that breath, allow the infinite mind to be the mind that flows through you in every aspect of your being. I invite you to know that this truth which surrounds and fills you is the only truth. It is that big T truth that so seeks to celebrate by means of us, by means of its creations. And I know right now for us in that realm of health and wholeness that the enough of God the infinite enough of God is celebrating itself through every fiber, every cell, every tissue every bone of every being on this planet that there is radiant wholeness and that there is enough health to go around there is enough wholeness for all to participate in and I know if there appears to be a need for money for abundance, for prosperity that any ideas which have sought to limit the availability are now dissolved from the consciousness, the collective consciousness, the race mind of all life. And that we know there is enough, there is more than enough because God is infinite. God, the infinite presence who centers everywhere, whose circumference is nowhere, absolutely is informing all beings everywhere. And I know that there is a receptivity and availability to know 
I have all that I need. We have all that I need, enough to share and to spare. In this world, we share and we serve each other with that abundance, with that abundant love, that abundant prosperity, that abundant possibility, that abundant acceptance, peace, comfort, compassion. And if the need is somewhere around right action or creative life or job, employment, I know that God is right here and right now clarifying and standing forth as right employment, as right creativity, as right place and right action. God is the source and everything else is simply the channel. And we know right now the channels are wide open and that there is perfect activity. And if the need appears to be right relationship, I know that as each of us aligns and gets into right relationship with who we are as infinite beings, ah, the world is blessed with wholeness, with love, with peace. That there is a divine revealing of the healing that is already present in every area. And so I know that this is the truth. And I know that all of us embrace this and we say, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. Let's say that together. I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. So we know that this is already, already, already so. All we have certainly done here is recognize that this is all that's going on. This is the reality of God, the reality of life, the reality of spirit. This is the truth. This is the truth. And we choose now to live according to that big T truth. Let it tell any little, little T truths to simply sit down, take a seat. God's in charge. God's got this. So with gratitude, I release these words into the law of infinite mind, knowing that it is already so. I declare it as so, and I invite you to say with me, amen. time in our service when Sydney removes her mask and I invite you to take your gifts your tithes your love offerings and simply hold them in your hand whether you are here in this room or you are in the zoom room or the Facebook live room wherever you are in your own room and take that gift even if it is one that is going automatically from your bank account I want you to just take this idea in your hand and hold it to your heart and say with me from the love of pure spirit within me. I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith in belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you, God. Yeah. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, beautiful. So we have some, oh yeah, mask. So ladies, you put your lipstick on, you put your mask on, you take your mask off, do you look like Bozo? <laughs> Just checking, do I, do I look like Bozo? <laughs> All right, so we have some announcements here. Wonderful ways for you to make donations uh, to the church. Um, one of course is call the office, 818. 762-7566. You can go to nhcrs.org slash give. You can text the word give to 818-457-3419. And here's the best. This is the best. You can give through Shop Amazon. Amazon Smile. You, we're all shopping. Are we all ordering on Amazon? I think so. And guess what? If you sign up for Smile, Church of Religious Science, North Hollywood, when you shop, they just give us money. Hello? That's tremendous. So sign up. OK, so um, also we have here, we have prayer with a practitioner. We have it here. If you want to come forward, a practitioner will pray with you here in person. Or you can go over to the Zoom, and a practitioner will pray with you on Zoom. So if you're on Facebook Live, you're going to have to transfer over to Zoom. And there are practitioners dying to pray with you. Um, you can also email a prayer request to prayer at nhcrs.org or put in a request in the prayer box at the back of the church here. Um, and you can also call in a prayer request to church office, option four. And please join us next Wednesday. Wasn't this lovely? Wasn't, it, wasn't this lovely? Thank you. That's so lovely. That's so lovely. So join us again next week when Rev Reverend Sidney will be talking about ready, willing, and able, and we all want to be, so come back. Um, uh, youth church is open. Bring your children. We're here. We're ready to serve them. We're so excited to have them back, so please bring your children here. And teens, hello teens, come join us. Um, and we have the Circle of Healing this Sunday, October 17th at 11.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. Join practitioner Mary Catherine O'Hart, and she will guide you via your chakras in a loving and healing experience. We also have this Sunday, we have Feeding the Homeless. Our love and kindness ministry is Feeding the Homeless this Sunday. And I have to tell you, I've done it. It's such an exciting and wonderful experience to serve in that way. So please come and join that ministry. You can go to our website to find out more about it and volunteers. And we take donations for that feeding as well. And uh, oh, here's some good stuff. Free spooktacular. That's right, hello. Um, Friday, October 29th from 7 to 10 p.m. You can come here and we're going to watch Young Frankenstein, a fave, and followed by Treats on the Patio. There will also be a costume contest, so please dress up. October 29th, that'll be so much fun. Now, I want you to know, Yeah. I'm going to take this off just for a moment. I'll, yeah. I'll, Is she I'll bozo? No bozo. Okay. I didn't put lipstick on Well, there you go. <laughs> See, she's smart, no lipstick. Um, do you have orange flyers in your bulletins, in your programs? OK. Take those home. Put them on your refrigerator, because this will be a spooktacular event. And we will do this costume contest, and we will have prizes. I mean, we will have some killer prizes. I want you to know that. There will be candy. There will be treats. And then we're going to come back, and we're going to watch Young Frankenstein in the spooktuary. <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you, thank you so much. I'm here five nights a week. How's your steak? Um, and it's free. It's our gift to you because we want to hang out. We're going to stay distance. We're going to wear our masks. And it's Halloween, so of course we're wearing masks. But we want you to come and just celebrate. Let's be together in our spooktuary. Absolutely. Community, so much fun, so much fun in her spooktuary. Okay, so practitioner Sabrina Johnson will facilitate aligned meditation series for veterans, frontline workers, and, com and the community that supports them. So this is a free meditation event. It takes place on three Sundays, October 31st, November 7th, November 14th at 11.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. What a wonderful thing to get to participate in. And for more information, you can contact Sabrina on um, the website. Um, oh, you guys, you know what? We are looking for people to help out on Facebook. You know, we have Facebook monitors, and we need some support there. And I got to tell you, I do it, and it's so much fun, and it's really, really easy. So if you want to serve, if you're looking for a place to serve, this is a wonderful place to serve. So we invite you to contact us and serve on our Facebook Live. And we have our Zoom virtual patio, both before and after Sunday and Wednesday services. And of course, don't forget we have our every morning, Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m., our Zoom meditation, 15 minutes, great way to start your day. So that's all I got to say. And Reverend Sydney will give us our benediction. Absolutely. And by the way, ministry is all about the shoes. You've heard me say that. <laughs> that right there. All right. Thank you. So let's just take a moment one more time. Breathing in once again a deep awareness of the power, the presence, the love that is God, this spirit that surrounds and fills us. It is that which sustains and maintains. It is that which has created all life and expresses constantly in all life. And with such gratitude now that we have been able to share in that spirit together, that we've been able to be together today. I know that this good that we have felt, that we have experienced is multiplying through us, as us, and that which we had a need to shift has shifted. The blessings we sought, we have now received them. We hold them. We know that we are the experience. We are the blessing in action. And how wonderful and how good it is to know that we get to do this together in connection and community and love. And so I bless this church. I bless all churches everywhere. I bless all synagogues, temples, ashrams, mosques, whatever the form of worship, because we all know that there are so many paths to God because there are so many of us here. So we are on that path and we honor all paths to God and bless them. So I'm certain that we are a blessing to each other and in the world and as we leave here tonight, I know that we inspire everyone around us, maybe even without them knowing we are that light that touches their light, that touches their light, that touches their light, and we are that living namaste in this beautiful blue planet. So I'm grateful for all of it. Ah, oh, I release this, and I know that we are all guided, guarded, and open-hearted as we move into our lives, and so it is, and together we say, amen.